welcome to the Goon Around the Podcast. I'm your host Giles, and joining me to review the high noon showdown and share their tales of their Valentine's experiences are the following. Akil, how you doing mate? You good? Best Valentine's ever. Best Valentine's ever. <laughs> good man, and um, our editor and main man in the engine room, Rick. I know you're still smarting from the relocation of the uh, Rams to the Golden State, but um, how was your day anyhow? The day was fantastic. It was a very, very early start, uh, so I've had a nap, but we're, we're good. Coolio, good stuff. And we've got a podcast virgin, first timer. His name is Jazz ASC. Jazz, how are you, sir? Good good evening, and thanks for joining us. Uh, guys, thanks for having me on. Good to be here. Good man, good man, good man. Right, let's uh, kick it off. Uh, 2-1, Emirates, high noon show down against the league leaders, Looked ropey for a while, for a very long while, um, but we time, we time now turned it around. I, I want to start um, ask, by asking you guys the lineups. I mean, it was to be expected. We heard that um, Gabriel had dropped out for injury late, late yesterday, and Per was coming in, and obviously Ocklen had to start in place of Flamini. Um, looking at the game going ahead, were you confident that this team would? Would um, get a result for us, Akil. Start with you. Um, I wouldn't say confidence is the right word. I think in a big game like this, nerves come into it. Uh, the big word mentality comes into it. But I mean, looking at the starting lineup, I thought you can't really argue with that. Um, I, what, what I did like was our options off the bench. I like the fact that we had Walcott, we had Joel Campbell, and obviously we had um, we had Danny Welbeck. I mean, to, to kind of show the bench, Owobi didn't even get anywhere near it today, purely because we've got other players back. So, and it was also good to see El back on the bench as well. So I thought I thought we had options. It was a blow maybe to to lose Gabriel, um, but you know I, I, I've, I've said it in the week. I think even if Mertesacker does play. It, you know, Hector Bellerin's got a massive job on, and I thought he'd done it really well. So, yeah, you know, all in all, I, I was, I was, I was happy enough with it. Um, uh, but you know, in a big game, anything could happen, really. Uh, Rick, um, Leicester City, you knew how they were going to set up, you knew how they were going to play. Were you surprised by the? Well, I wouldn't say easy, which they nullified after in the first half, but were you? Did it concern you um, as the as the first half wore on? How comfortable Leicester City were looking in in, in in you know in light of the fact that we knew we had to start fast. It uh, I don't know how long it concerned me. It, it started to later in the game, um, but they were very disciplined and they they pressed very very well. But a lot of times when teams do that. Uh, you see them tire in the second half. So I was I was trying to maintain my confidence that they would tire in the second half and and we'd have a good go at them. But I was I was frustrated at our our lack of uh, incisiveness in the final third. The the times we dribbled to nowhere, made a bad pass. It's it's always frustrating. But uh, it just the later the game got, the more concerned I was. Yeah. Um, Jeff, let me come to you. What do you put? What do you put down? What do you put this sort of? I would say profligacy is probably not exactly the right term, but we've struggled recently to really sort of like stick teams where, I mean, Bournemouth is obviously, a, 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 you know, a, um, a break from the norm. But, you know, in recent times, we've really struggled to put teams away. I mean, what do you put that down to? Do you think it's a lack of options or do you think it's a lack of confidence in our strikers? I think maybe uh, it's a combination of the both. I think, uh, Going forward, uh, the goals have dried up recently, and I think we're just getting back into it. I think it was something like four games without a goal, so uh, I think slowly the confidence is coming back, and then uh, even today, I think you could see it. They gave us all the time in the world in the first half, but um, we kind of looked like we didn't know what to do with it once the ball came close to the box. I think we were uh, playing uh, quite a few crosses, and I haven't seen that recently. I think uh, the Ox had one of his best games uh, of the season. But um, it just seemed like no one was getting on the end of it in the first half. That's quite right. Uh, um, Akil, as uh, just as just uh, alluded, yeah. we, we you know we we seem to be getting down there with the the, the outside quite often, but often too often um, Giroud was either a, a pace or two, a yard or two behind the play, or not in the box, or where we did. Quite often we found him going up against four or five defenders, and no one else sort of running in there. 
rounds. He didn't have a great game today. Would you say, I mean, do you see, do you think now that, um, you know, Theo and, and Welbeck are back that we'll start to see more people sort of like assisting and in terms of getting goals for, you know, to help Giroud? Um, I, I, I thought Ramsey, I thought, I thought Ramsey did have that bad of a game. Um, I think sh- someone showed me his stats after the game and his sort of interceptions and, and his passing accuracy was, was, was quite good. Um, you know, I think once once we were eleven against ten, he kind of played in that quarterback type position. Certainly when when Francis Cochran went off, so he was kind of getting the ball from the back four and kind of going forward with it. And I thought he took quite quite a lot of responsibility there. Obviously, it was a lot easier because oh, you know Leicester was sitting back. Um, it, it, it was it was you know so Chamberlain got into good positions I thought second first half I mean in the first minute or two he, he had that he had that chance where you just wanted him to maybe take the shot um, but there was one or two times where he got into good positions um, but you know maybe I mean it, it was just one of those where the defenders kind of got to got to the ball quicker I mean you know confidence is a big part of football and, and we always look at our, our own players and their confidence but remember Hoof and, and Morgan are absolutely before today were, were, were on top of the world as well so when you're high on confidence you take the risk and you think you can intercept more you think you can get there quicker than the striker and I think that was that was kind of part of it what we saw when when Walcott sort of came on um, he, he kept the width well but at the same time, when when the ball was on the other side and stuff, he he wanted to get in that box, and that that's how the first goal came about. Mm-hmm. And obviously, it was an Aaron Ramsey ball in as well. So it it, it was, you know, I think I think it's, it's that key word options, you know, and we had sort of Joel Campbell on the right and Alexis on the left. Um, Often they would both want to come in, and even when Walcott was on the left, they would both want to come in. Whereas I think now we've got the options to go wide as well as come in. Um, but I, you know, I thought, thought uh, Sanchez was quite ordinary, to be honest. And I think once he starts finding his his feet again um, and gets sharp, then I think we will be really dangerous. All right, let me take it back. Um, let's focus on. Take, take it moment. back, buddy. Take it back. <laughs> yeah. Let's focus first on um, Mertesacker's game. Do you feel that? Um, I'm going to start with you, Alex. Do you feel that he was? He, you know, he wasn't unduly pressured. I mean, you said that, you know, the onus was on Bellerin to be quite um, mindful and, and sort of pragmatic, I suppose, in certain ways to ensure that uh, we weren't exposed down the right-hand side. Do you think that um, people were unduly sort of worried by Mertesacker being in there ahead of Gabriel, or instead of Gabriel? Um I mean, I think the worry came from not knowing if Francis Cochrane's going to make it. And, you know, I think, I think the fear was if Matthew Flamini plays a lot, uh, ahead of uh, the, the centre backs, then potentially they could be left exposed. There was also a bit about will our full backs keep bombing on? Um, but I think they were both very mature and I think they both had a you know, good sort of offensive and defensive performance. I think in the first sort of 50 minutes or so, 53 minutes before Simpson was sent off, in terms of chances for Leicester, they they had the they, they had the Vardy header, um, and they had that sort of shot from the just outside the area on the left, which kind of checked put out for a corner, I think. So there wasn't much there. I think we we kept the ball well. I thought on the counter attacks, we kind of Ramsey and Cockerland dropped quickly. Were were were, were aware. So I think Mertesacker Saka was. I mean, we were probably rightly worried just because of the lack of pace. But I think in truth, there wasn't. I, I wasn't too worried I was actually quite quite fairly relaxed about that um, and obviously for, for their goal they caught us but there were so many things that happened in that you know from from, from the, the Ozil free kick that wasn't given to Koscielny taking off um, uh, taking out Kante when actually he tried to go and head of the ball and just got him <laughs> got him at the back yeah. so there, there was a few things there but I mean I thought, I thought Mertesacker was fine today I thought he was solid I thought the full backs helped and, and the midfield in front helped and then once Simpson went off it was obviously a different game and I thought Callum Chambers also did, did very well very calm um and then you know, just 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 did everything right to be honest. So no, I think I think we should be quite happy with that. Jazz um, Akil alluded to before the penalty was awarded to Leicester City. Um, Ozil was fouled by I don't know if it was Wes Morgan or whoever. Morgan. But, uh, was it Morgan? Yeah. Over. Yeah. Um, social media went absolutely apoplectic. I read that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what was it? What was it like um, in the ground? Um, was you at the ground, Akil? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, as you know, where I sit, that, that's directly yeah. line with me. Um, yeah. And I kind of, uh, to be fair, I, the lino probably couldn't see it because I, I'm obviously row 11, so I'm a little bit ahead, so I can kind of see over. But I thought the ref was in such a good position that I, I couldn't believe, couldn't believe he didn't see that. And I, you know, showed my passion, shall I say, and just kind of told the referee exactly what I thought of him, not that he could hear me. But um, <laughs> just, it, it, did you use foul language? Um, but <laughs> no comment, no comment. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it, it was it, it was a foul. It, you know, we could all see it was a foul. Um, but, but I don't know, I don't know what what the ref was seen to be honest. So, but yeah, it, I think everyone thought it was a foul live. So, apart from the ref, Jazz. Um... As I said, social media went absolutely crazy that, um, you know, Ezio wasn't given the foul. But the actual challenge by um, Monreal on Vardy, how did you see it? I mean, a lot of people saying it was a dive. Do you think it was a dive? Or do you think Vardy sort of used a bit of cunning to actually draw the foul out of out of Monreal? Yeah, I think the the key word, we, uh, he won that penalty. So uh, I guess... Uh, I think uh, Monreal didn't really use any movement there, but the way uh, Vardy came at him and he gave himself the opportunity to go down there, and I think uh, even I think Thierry Henry and uh, Pondicherry said uh, he would have done the same thing in that situation, and uh, you can't really blame him for winning that penalty in that situation if Monreal gave him the chance to go down. But I think uh, if we're being honest, that wasn't a penalty. Do you agree with that, um, Rick? I absolutely agree with it. Um... I mean, we've seen it before where a player just, just kicks a ball and it's it's going out of bounds. He's never going to get there. And uh, he, uh, he keeps running. I think we lost a kill. Sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Nick's, you know, he kicks the ball into a place where he's not even running, and he continues running the different direction to, in order to go over uh, Monreal's leg. Um, now, naturally, absolutely, you can call that a penalty. Monreal left his leg out. Um, there was there was contact. I don't know that he dove at all, but gosh, you, you would think that in those cases you would realize that he was never getting to it anyway, and he's just looking for a foul. Let's uh, move on to the first listener's question, and we've got a question from at Mujib one seven nine four two zero, and he asks, "Would Welbeck be a better option to play up front than Drew?" So I suppose that kind of goes in hand in hand with what I was asking earlier about uh, the the lack of goals that we're sort of seeing from our front line. Obviously, Welbeck's come back today and um, he's won us the game. Jasmine, I'll start with you. Do you think, um, you know, that Welbeck had a great game when he came on? Walcott looked very lively, you know, brought us back into the game. Do you think, you, do you expect Wenger to sort of mix it up going forward and maybe Hull and we got obviously looking further ahead, Man United? Yeah, I definitely see him uh, getting uh, at least a few minutes against Hull, or probably even a start. And I think uh, he offers something different, obviously, with his movement. But um, I think today he only had the, the three touches, if you include the goal as well. So uh, it's hard to tell yet like what kind of uh, uh, fitness he's in. So um, I think uh, he'll definitely get his chances in the, the next few weeks. But um, it's good to have that option now. And I think he offers a bit more uh, to Theo. I think he's a bit tighter on the ball. He's a bit, uh, a bit bad there technically. And... Um, I think, yeah, definitely. We need uh, another outlet, especially when we're trailing in games, just to uh, even go to that 4-4-2 system like we did today. Mm. And uh, I think it's uh, just another option of breaking teams down. Uh, when we come to you, Ax, uh, it was more like a 4-1-4 in the end or something, wasn't it? 4 4 one yeah. it got 4 2 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But we like the way that, that um, Walcott was kind of dropping into the centre when the ball was going wide and offering another sort of target. You know, other than Giroud. I mean, his goal came from, as you said, somebody crossed it in from the right, was it? Was it yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, Giroud knocked it down and there he was, in the, you know, on the end of it to knock it in. Do you think, obviously, people have been saying, with Villain, lots of debates and arguments about Walcott, you know, being given a chance, even though he'd been pretty awful since the, man, the last Man City game in December. Do you think, you know... This sort of will give Wenger uh, a few more happy dilemmas in terms of maybe resting Giroud because Giroud's done you know a manful amount of work in the last few months or you know leading the line. He's obviously the last five or six games or so he hasn't scored, but he's got two assists, one today, one against Bournemouth last week. Do you think? Do you, would you like to see Wenger mix it up? Or do you think that Giroud should be you know 
given some more opportunities to sort of get back on the gold trail. Uh, you, you mix it up where you can. I mean, with Welbeck, I mean, the boy's been out since last April. You know, he played 10 minutes today. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves and and start thinking he'll he'll start ahead of Giroud. You know, let, let's kind of give him time, give him patience, maybe give him 30 minutes against Hull, um, maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes against Barcelona if we need him. And let's just take our chance and... You know, obviously, then we go to Old Trafford, where where it's a special place for him, and where he's already got the winner for Arsenal Football Club. So, you know, we got to be patient with him. I think with Walcott, I mean, yeah, he 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 has been ordinary. Um, you could say he was sort of played out of position on the left as well, where he's not used to. But you know, players will have bad patches, and the only way to get over it is to put them back on, let them go again, and and and, and change it around. And hopefully, this goal would have just changed sort of his confidence and, and he was pumped as well after the goal he, he really revved himself up revved up the crowd he was he was pumped you know I think, I think all the sort of he doesn't care type stuff maybe has, has, maybe he's heard a bit about that and he just kind of has felt it you, you can you can see there was something there um, I, 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 I kind of half expect Walcott to start against Hull next week up front probably um, I think Giroud will get a breather because there's two too well you know after sort of Hull in the cup we've, we've then got um, obviously Barcelona Man United Swansea and Spurs so four absolutely huge games I mean you, you could argue Barcelona's actually the, the smallest of game in terms of you know the, the bigger picture but I mean Olivier Giroud will be needed then so I, feel, I kind of expect Walcott to play up front and players like Joel Campbell and El Nenny to, to kind of get a start as well um I just think you kind of go game by game a little bit. You, you, just, you just see how the other, see, see how they're playing, see how they're doing in training, see who's kind of physically there, physically not there. Look at the opponents. Um, you know, we've got options. You know, a sort of month ago we had none, so it's great to have them. Okay, um, Rick, the right hand side. <clears throat> we've now got f- got three or four players we've thrown out the hat into the ring. You know, um, as well as Campbell, who's been rested. Oxley Chamberlain last week did a good job on the right. Scored. Um, Theo's come in a day, started on, you know, came in on the right, scored. Welbeck, come on, scored. Uh, <laughs> let alone the, the striking position, the right wing position is probably even more of a sort of a happy dilemma for, for Wenger. Who would you, in your estimation, get the start on the right hand side for you? Uh, well, I, I guess it would depend on the game. Um, against Hull, uh, I, I'd like to see, you know, Campbell or Welbeck uh, given a shot again. Um, Obviously, Chamberlain earned his start today. He uh, scored a nice goal the week prior and uh, and played uh, actually a pretty effective game today. But uh, we have plenty of options, and I'm not sure any one of them really stands out head and shoulders above the others, and I think maybe that's that's an issue for us. Um, it's obvious uh, it's going to be an issue for Campbell uh, going forward. As, as you know, is he does he fit in the squad or not? I guess it all depends on how much he expects to play. But it's obvious that... Fingers going to start Walcott, Chamberlain, and even Wellback over Campbell most of the time. So, uh, again, I think it's too many choices and not one really standing out. The partnership of that like, we've not really seen really is of of, of Coquelin and Ramsey in the centre. Uh, Akil and Ramsey didn't have too bad a game. He, his pass rate apparently was high, and his uh, interceptions were pro- apparently pretty good. Uh, Jazz, we've been waiting for this combination to, to sort of like being given its, its head. Looking at today's game, how do you think they played? I mean, we knew that um, Leicester would allow us the ball sit deep and break on us. How do you think they played against the likes of Drinkwater and, and, and Angola Kante? I think, uh, well, they struggled a little bit in the first half. I think Kante, uh, he's obviously known he doesn't give you any space in that midfield. And we struggled a little bit to get the ball and control of that midfield. But I think uh, I think last week against Bournemouth and this week, Ramsey's uh, definitely improved. I think and today having Coquelin in behind, I think, gives it that little bit more security just to uh, sort of bomb on a bit more. I think uh, with Flamini in there, I don't think you get that protection. And there were times, especially against, like, if you remember the Southampton game and uh, even against Chelsea, they, they were walking through our midfield pretty much with Flamini there protecting that back four. I think uh, you could just see the difference in the midfield today. Uh, just uh, looks like a different picture at the moment. Indeed. Uh, Akil, yourself, um, a lot of people 
uh, uh, sort of wondering how going forward these two would be able to sort of work a tandem, a partnership. Who's the first receiver? Who do you see that is the person that will sort of like alleviate the pressure of the, the burden of the defence and sort of pick the ball up from the defence and start initiating attacks? Do you think that will, that role will go to Aaron Ramsey? Um, or do you think, um, you know, we'll see uh, Cochrane sort of... In, because Cochrane's quite an underrated passer of the ball, isn't he? He's sort of seen as a breaker and a stopper and, you know, one of the, a sort of a police officer, but he's, 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 he's not got bad ability on the ball. Do you think he... He'll be seen more of a sort of a first receiver than, than Firmino, or just think that the responsibility will now go to Aaron Ramsey and, and he'll flourish in that role, in that respect? Uh, I think it'll be a bit a bit of both, really. I think with, with, when Flamini was there, Ramsey kind of had the pressure where he, he always had to be that person, you know. You kind of, uh, you know, back to goal, Matthew Flamini getting the ball, turning with it, picking a pass. It, it It's not something you see Flamini do, you know. He's got sort of other parts of his game that maybe, you know, were were, were useful in certain games. But with, with Cochran, as you say, he can pass the ball better. I mean, if you remember the start of the season, he kind of... He did the simple things well. He would get that ball. He'll be able to turn. He would give it out left or right to the fullbacks. He would try to start attacks. And then he had a period where he thought he was kind of Zinedine Zidane and was playing all these Hollywood balls. And, and there was one particular game at home. I can't remember it was, but where he just had one of those games where every pass just wasn't happening. But since then, he's kind of obviously realised actually that's not my role. He's probably listened to what Thierry Henry's been saying on Sky and what, what everyone's been saying. Just thought, you know what, actually this is this is my role. So I think there'll be a bit of a mix, you know, as as there was when Santi Cazola was there. You kind of felt confident giving it to either, and I think it's going to be be sort of similar here. I just think Ramsey won't have that pressure to always have to kind of be the one to. To get the ball, you know, it, it, it's you can kind of see it now in the next game, you know, Cochrane sort of having no options, launching it to Giroud, who flicks onto an Aaron Ramsey run, who scores, you know, and gets a chance. Perhaps it's just, I think, I think that's a great option that you know either can kind of play that role now. But I think we'll see Cochrane sort of doing more. Uh, he's certainly a lot more disciplined. You know, you won't see him in the opposition box like you like you did with Matthew Family. <laughs> right, okay. Um let's move on to another question. Here's a question I think Jazz you got give us a question that you got earlier on today. Uh yeah, basically it was um a question I got about uh Do you Hard to Simpson and you whether uh, whether or not the result would have been different had he stayed on the pitch. So do you remember the person's name? We'd like to give credit to the people that, that do give us send us questions. Do you remember who it was that answered the question? I can't find it just now but okay. uh yeah. No worries. All right. So, re- re- repeat that. Sorry, you're saying. Yeah, basically, how would the game have turned out if uh, Simpson had not picked up his red card in the uh, early in the second half? Uh, I'll give that to you, Rick. Oh, that's a tough one to answer. Um, I don't know that it would have really turned out much differently. Um, he wasn't really the person carrying them forward. I think it had. I think it had more to do with who they took off. They took off Mares. They took off Okazaki. Um, I, I think it had more to do with their substitutions than it did being down to ten men. Um, we probably still would have developed into a game where we were taking shots, throwing it into the box, trying to get a goal, um, just dominating possession. I don't. I think that would have been the same. I think. I actually think the uh, the substitutions had more to do with the the turnaround than than the sending off. Acts, what do you reckon? Uh, it, it, I, I, I don't know. It, it's football. If, if in 2006 in Paris when it was pouring down with rain, if he had the and stayed on the field, Arsenal might have a European Cup. So you know, it, it, it's football, mate. It, it's no idea. If Mertz had stayed on the field the other week against uh, Chelsea, would the result have been different? My guess is probably yes, but that's football. Julio, really, yeah. all right. Um, Jazz, you want to answer your your list, your followers' question yourself? Or? Yeah, I say I say there's I couldn't see us picking up a win from that position, especially the way they were playing. I think uh think Claudio Radieri is really yeah. as well. He said as well, uh they were going for that second goal, I think they were pushing for that. So uh he was confident about it as well. So I think at best we would have pulled out a draw maybe, but it was really looking uh, tight there. I was surprised he took Marez off actually. When I looked up I thought it would be all Brighton. Um or even Osazaki maybe, but I thought it would be all Brighton to go off, but 
Well, that's what Marlon's go off. I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised. Do I mean, you think that? Do you think that's more to do with the, maybe he doesn't defend as well as yeah, yeah, yeah. gets up and down the field, doesn't he? Yeah, maybe, so maybe, is, maybe. But in terms of if Leicester had got a second, it would have been you know, and this was just after sort of um, uh, when he he had the second penalty shout when he kind of twisted and turned Monreal. Um, obviously, whether there was contact or not, I don't know. I couldn't see it from, from where I was, even though I am quite close. But It was a dive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, in terms of he looked quite dangerous. So, I tell you what, I was, I was pleased when he went off. Um, so, yeah. Maybe they just thought, yeah, as you say, you know, it's one of those when we go down to 10 men. Against, right against Chelsea, we went down to 10 men and we were going to make a sub. A lot of the guys in front of me were, were, were kind of hoping Aaron Ramsey went off. But, you know, Ramsey covers the most ground in our whole team. You don't take Ramsey off when you're down to 10. It was one of those things, maybe, that Albrighton, yes, you're right, covers more ground. I don't know. Julio, but... cool, yeah. all right. Um... Robert's come on, he scored the winner at the death. Did, did you see it coming at, in the ground? Did, did, did the crowd feel it coming? Or was you kind of like getting desperate and thinking it might not happen? It, it was strange, actually, because the last five minutes, the atmosphere was really flat. There wasn't much noise. There was a sense of nervousness. It, it was I mean, Obviously, it was a pin drop. It felt like pin drop silence from both ends. Even Leicester were quiet. Arsenal certainly were quiet. It just felt... You know, I looked around me and I thought, where is all the noise? Where is all the... Where is all the... Trying to pump the players up? Where? And I kind of looked and, it, it, and it, it's by no means a criticism, but I could see on people's faces they were absolutely nervous. Um, and and we, we kind of, you know, just, just didn't know what to do kind of thing. It was such a massive moment. I think it, we knew if we don't get a goal here, that that's that's the title finish. I think that started to sink in a little bit to to, to people. So it was a. I think everyone has hope. You know, you go to a football game, there's always hope. You know, you, until the last second of the game, you have that hope that your team will score a goal. But it, it was a little bit of a. I'm not sure if we're going to do it here, and then you could. You, you, you could see it was nervy. You know, Arsene Wenger was sort of probably off camera, but he was up and down, up and down, up and down, and he was turning around, looking, you know, and he, he was nervous, we were nervous, players looked a bit nervous. Um, so, yeah, I think, I'm not sure if we expected it, there was certainly hope, but, but it, was a, it was a weird, it was a surreal moment, actually. I don't think I've kind of experienced that in a while. It was a real surreal moment. Rick, coming to you, um, how do you, was you in the pub, in your local pub with, you, with your Gooners? We were. Oh yeah. What was the feeling in What was the feeling in the pub? That, you know, as, as the game was drawing to a close, and we were, you know, it was one all, and you know, time was running out. Did you? Did, what was the feeling in the pub there, amongst the Well, we were a lot of anxiety. A lot of uh, a couple of guys got up, and started pacing. There was a lot of uh, a lot of anxiety. Of course, we had uh, we had been there since uh, six o'clock in the morning, so we had a Great probably effort. too much probably too much caffeine along with our our beverages. Caffeine. So, <laughs> Caffeine, yeah. Coffee, Jeez. coffee. Well, you don't yeah. like. <laughs> well, you know, it had a little Jameson in it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was we. It was very anxious. Uh, we were pacing. Uh, the frustration started growing. Uh, obviously, Theo scoring that goal really, really lightened the mood. But we still wanted to win. You know, we desperately wanted to win. But uh, it, it it was very anxious and just. You know, going to the last few minutes, you kept wondering, just like Akil said, are we going to do this? Are we going to do this? You weren't sure. You weren't sure. Jazz, you're quite, you know, you're quite active on 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 Twitter and social media. The reaction um, as, as the clock was ticking down, um, were you getting sort of caught up in the oh f we're not going to do it, blah blah blah? You know, it's happened again. How many shots on goal and we can't score, we can't win, think- we're out of the title race. How did you do it? I mean, was you sort of trying to keep it a calm head as as time was ticking down? Or I think that's uh, normal the way the way the season's gone. I think uh, so many times uh, we haven't found that late goal. I think uh, there's a stat that uh, just we we hadn't scored a, a winner or an equaliser in the last ten minutes of any game this season. So basically, I think everyone was resigned to the fact that we're just going to pick up a draw. But uh, uh, so, so that was the first time this season that we'd actually scored in the last ten minutes of a game. To get uh, a, win- a winner or an equaliser, yeah. Wow, that's an incredible stat. So that basically, incredible. I think uh, basically everyone everyone had accepted that 
there's going to be a draw, especially as it got to. Did we not? Did we not? Did we not win at uh, win at home to Newcastle in the 83rd minute? No, that was uh, that was at like the mid 70 minutes, I think. No, 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 that was that was about 80, 83rd. I'm sure it was. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> <can't remember. laughs> All right. Um, All right. So here we've got a question here from Neil B. Um, What's his name? Neil B. Out from the Purely Arsenal podcast. Neil B. Underscore 70. And he asks, should Rex be reprimanded for not punishing career-threatening tackles? Obviously, he's talking about um, Danny, is it Danny Drinkwater. Was it Danny's, is it Danny Drinkwater? One of the Dannys on um, Aaron Ramsey. Terrible tackle. Could have done him a lot of damage. Um, Ax, should referees be punished? Because obviously, he might be punished retrospectively or we've seen players get punished retrospectively when referee doesn't see or doesn't see an incident obviously maybe the referee saw the incident and decided to play on in, in which case uh, it might not be taken forward by the FA but should referees be called to account it's uh, a tough one isn't it uh, it's a real tough one I mean it, it's a matter of have they seen it have they not seen it um <sighs> You know, it, it takes me back to sort of Eduardo's and um, was it Martin Taylor, and straight after the game, Arsene Wenger came out and said that boy should never play football again. Thinking, and this isn't about the referee, but this is just kind of showing a different angle that he said Martin Taylor should never play football again. He later retracted the statement after he saw it several times and, and saw it in sort of real time. So. You know, the, if the reaction, and of course it was a passionate day that day at, at St Andrews, and, and, and you know we were five points clear and all that sort of stuff, Gallas. So there was a lot of passion in there, but but that kind of highlights that the manager saw it, thought it was really bad, saw it again, and thought oh, actually, you know. So I know a referee's is a slightly different situation because the ref's not being asked to judge if the guy should play again, um, but it, it, it's it's a real tough one to see. You know, I think refs, I mean, believe me, when that Ozil free kick didn't go, I was absolutely going for the ref. But it's a real tough job. And, you know, I don't think a referee's out there to, you know, who wants to miss these kind of tackles. Um, It's it's bizarre because, I mean, you look at that sort of Ramsey one today. um, You look at Flamini's last week where... Oh, he was quite far away from the man and stuff like that, so I'm not sure he, he was close enough to, to kind of hurt anyone, but it was two-footed. The referee's obviously seen something because he's booked him, but if he's actually seen it, family should have been gone, we all agree. Mm. So yeah. it, it comes down to what has the referee seen. I think what, what would help is if the ref had more help. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I don't think the linesmen sort of help. I think UEFA's kind of two stickmen people in the just outside the box on the behind the goal side of the goal helping that hasn't really helped very much. Um, fourth official, what what do they actually do? I'm sure they do something. I'm sure they, you know, what do they do apart from listen to managers kind of moan at them? Um, so I think it, it's tough. You know, I know I haven't quite answered the question, but I think it's tough. I just think they, they really need more help. And I think with help, definitely with help, they could maybe do more. But ah, it's tough. You know, I'm not going to stop banging referees out because I just it, it's a tough job. But obviously, if that had damaged Aaron Ramsey's leg, and obviously Aaron Ramsey's already gone through stuff like that, you know, it, it, it it's it, you know, it's, it'll be a lot easier if the players just didn't do the. I don't know. Mm. Tough. Jazz. Um, yeah, it's, it, go on, go on, go on, Rick. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was. I, I think it's less. I. For me, it would be less about reprimanding the referee, because I, I like Akil said, they're not, you know, it's not like they feel good about missing it. <laughs> I think it's about uh, giving them help. And I know this is uh, very controversial, but over here in the States, MLS instituted video replay for the league. For, and it was more about um, combating diving and, and play acting than it was for, for things like this. But... Um, I don't have any issue with retrospective evidence um, and reprimanding a player for what they did. I, I wouldn't go after the referees so much, but it, it, it's just sometimes it's so hard to know for sure, and I think that's why people shy away from using things like that. But obviously, with, with people keep getting injured in, in terrible ways, uh, something might have to be done. 
Was the player booked for that incident, for that change? Or was he just sort of, I can't even remember. I remember the change. I don't I even know if it was called a foul. Yeah. Was it, was it, was he, was he cautioned or? Rep- uh, he was not, ca- he was not cautioned at all. I can't even remember if there was. I don't know. Uh, Ramsey kind of rolled over and then got up again. But he was quite yeah. peeved by it. He was pretty peeved. Yeah. I remember his reaction. He was pretty peeved. Uh, 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 Jazz, do you, you see the FA uh, using just, 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 just like, just before you ask, Jazz, I must apologise because Sheldon's goal was the seventy second, um, seventy second minute. So apologies there, you've you've got me. <laughs> <laughs> Jazz, um, do, you, do you think the FA will use Repish Petrovacin on? Was it Drinkwater? Am I? Am I? Is it Danny Drinkwater? That, that, I think it was. Yeah. Um, Akil, I just want to uh, talk about the crowd, um, the atmosphere before the game. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about um, Leicester City. Um, protesting about the change, the late change of schedule from the TV companies, and there was questions as to whether Arsenal fans or debates as to whether Arsenal fans should join in the protest or whether we should get there on time early and g the, the, the team up because this is not the day for protest. This is the day to make sure the team get our full support. How was it in the ground? What what happened? What transpired? Um, so I I actually got in slightly earlier, 15 or 20 minutes before kick-off, which for me is very early, because that does mean one less JD and Coke at the pub. Um, <laughs> but but I mean, with the extra security, I've been doing that for the last four or five games. But uh, as I went in, I, I, the first thing I did was wanting to just, just go. I didn't go to my seat, but I just stood at the end of the concourse and, and had a look at the Leicester fans and saw they were all there. And I actually tweeted a picture saying, oh, they're all there. I presume they'll kind of go off at kick-off, maybe, just before kick-off, see, maybe see the players in Clapham, and then maybe go off. I, I wasn't too sure. Um, but, sort of, as as the players came out, still there. Um, uh, you know, players clapped them, still there. The, the, the ch- uh, handshake, still there. And then the toss, still there. And then players, obviously, the two goalkeepers went to their ends, and players, and, and they were still there. And then the game started, and it was kind of like, oh, I thought you were going to... And then within seconds, Oxo Chamberlain was through and I think you kind of forgot a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it was it was bizarre. I mean, you know, sort of being sort of um, a part of the ASC and being a board member, we obviously had a lot of conversations about this um, and, and we were working sort of with Leicester, with their supporters' trust in, in a way where, you know, we were kind of supporting them because end of the day, games getting moved. It happened to Arsenal last year at when we played Hull. Um, it could happen again to Arsenal this season, where where we've got all our trains booked, hotels booked, etc., and things get moved. So it's not a whatever. Oh, it was only it was Leicester, so we don't care kind of thing. It, it, it's a football issue, similar to the ticket pricing. Um, so we were kind of supportive of it. We, we as a group kind of talked about it. What do we suggest Arsenal do before we are sort of ask, 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 our, ask our membership? Um, that w- what would we want to do? And, and I think the general consensus was that it's such a big game. I think, uh, you know, and then usually red action kind of, you know, make calls like this and atmosphere calls and stuff like that. But it, it was such a big game that I think it was kind of, we thought that people may not, be happy to, 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 to do a protest because it's such a big game um, and you know people want to support the team and you know, we're going for a title and all that sort of stuff so it was kind of thought okay maybe we're not sure if it is the right thing and then Red Action I kind of came out and said that you know perhaps a protest isn't isn't right here or isn't for everyone but when the Leicester City fans come back in let's applaud them like we applauded Bayern Munich um, but obviously it just never happened so I'm not sure what what or why I'm not sure if Leicester kind of at the same time as, as we were thinking our fans might not want to do it because there's a title race maybe Leicester thought that as well actually you know, if we do it and we concede one or two in the first five minutes suddenly you know I think they probably maybe they looked at Liverpool saw saw what happened there mm. and thought well do we want to be responsible whether Liverpool fans were responsible is an argument you know Jordan Henderson certainly said they're not but maybe there was a little bit about that back in their mind thinking you know what this is our best chance of a title um, in years maybe the only chance for years certainly in a lot of their lifetime so Let's protest later, and, and they did sing. Um, they did sing kind of um, Sky Sports, your something something kind of thing. So the, 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 there were certainly 
they they protested they in terms difference. of yeah. yeah they protested in terms of chanting but yeah it was it was it was all a bit a uh, bit mm. of a non-event really. Okie dokie. All right, look, we've got two cup games coming up. Hull City next Saturday, and then we've got the, the uh, UEFA Champions League game against uh, Barcelona, which we never lose at home. Then we've got three big games. We've got two games away to the well, two teams at the top. Hold on, hold on one hmm? second here. We, have, we, we haven't talked about the euphoric finish to the game yet, have we? Okay, yep. Yeah, okay, <laughs> let's do that. Let's do that. Um, that was pretty much the last kick of the game. Um, how was it in the pub? Oh, was it there was beer, insane. Beer, beer cans and beer, beer bottles and beer, <laughs> beer jars going up in the air being smashed. Was it, I mean, what, what was it like? Well, n- not not quite that rowdy, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was crazy because we were, I, I think the words actually left my lips, this is going to be the last play of the game. I mean, we were all st- standing there, biting our nails, clenching our teeth. Um, and, and when that goes in, um, Boy, we just went nuts. Uh, there was only a dozen of us there. Like I said, it was a 6 a.m. start, so it was uh, we didn't have full full crowd, but uh, we went absolutely crazy for 12 people. We made a lot of noise. <laughs> and Axe, um, tell us what was the feeling like? What was this, the, the the state of emotion in the 60,000 uh, football fans in the ground? It was there was sort of two reactions. There was the one, you know, absolutely craziness, hugging anyone around you. Jumping up and down, dancing, doing all the crazy stuff people do, and there was that other bit of just, oof, thank God for that. It was a, I, I saw one one of my mates who who sits next to me, and he he was just at, at his seat, just going, oh thank God for that. You know, I mean, Jamie Vardy looked knackered because he was chasing everything, but I tell you what, mentally we were more tired. We were that was a real shift we put in. I think as, as supporters all over the world, so. It, 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 it was the two reactions combined, and then there was a nice, you know, it was a nice five minutes where we, we kind of all celebrated. Obviously, players were pumped. Um, so yeah, no, it was it was nice, it was a nice way to end. All three substitutes um, Ring brought on all played their part, um, so it's a good victory. We're now third and, and, and goal. Sorry, just off. just on the substitutions as mm. well. I mean, you know, the the, the Cockerland sub was a. Uh, it pre- I don't think it's been highlighted much, but it, it, it was maybe an obvious sub, but it, it was a great sub as well because after the sending off, uh, Cockerland had got himself fired up. He started firing up the North Bank. He, he started, you know, waving his hands around, saying, "Come on!" I'm fired up with the Mares. <laughs> well, no, but this was before before Mares. So okay. he, he, had, he had he had really fired himself up, and you thought, okay, he, he's fired up now. Good, stay stay around there. Obviously, he had been booked as well. And then he just, with the Morris thing, he just suddenly lost it a bit and started pushing him. And we, we kind of, you know, there, there was, again, two reactions. Some people are like, yeah, go on, go on, yeah, make him go off, go on. And I was thinking, mate, get the hell out of there. What are you doing? You're on a yellow card. You know, that's when I wanted Mertesacker was captain just to grab him and say, seriously, mate, what the fuck are you doing? You know, we're, 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 we've got ten men. We can win this game. Just shut up. Yeah, we have... We had both reactions. We were there was three or four of us, yeah. just like you. The first second you saw it, you're like, "Yeah, get in!" And then you're like, "We all three realized he was on a yellow card at the same time." We're like, "Oh shit, yeah. get away from him!" <laughs> and then he was he was pretty much taken off a few minutes later, which I thought you know was was a really good sign. Piece of management, uh, yeah. But yeah, and, and and Chambers played his part. He you know he but he played his part as well in you know keeping keeping them at bay. So we're we're third now. Goal difference. We've got. Still quite a terrible goal difference to Tottenham. And Tottenham went and won at uh, in the in the Dying Embers at uh, Etihad. Um, we've got two cup games, and then we've got you know some really big games. We've got Man United away, Swansea at home, and then down at the uh, the White Hart Lane on the fifth of March. Massive, massive game now coming up. I'm, I'm actually myself a bit more. I'm going up to Matt Old Trafford, but I'm actually not as I'm not as filled with as much trepidation as I have been in past years. Man United are an insipid team now, and um, I'll be very disappointed if we don't come out with three points. But for me, the the Tottenham game away, Tottenham are playing extremely well. They are fit, you know, they're very confident. I'm worried about that game. I'm going to ask you, Jazz, how do you see this next block of games coming up? Yeah, I think uh, coming to that Boston again, this. A bit of an unwelcome distraction. I think uh, it's come pretty much at the wrong time of the season. We just look like we're about to put a run of games, a run of results together, and uh, 
I don't know how we're going to cope with that game. Especially, I think today they won six one, so they look like they're in like some kind of a imperious form at the moment. So, well, hey, they conceded one though, so that's there's a bit hope there, but I think um, <laughs> there's a bit that, of hope there. <laughs> Sorry, that was funny. Yeah, that Tottenham game uh, coming up, I think that's the one that everyone's uh, a bit worried about. I think we're all hopeful of, of that Man United game of picking up three points. I think uh, we can expect that, especially with their, I think they've had a very poor uh, couple of weeks now. I think they've dropped out of the top four race, so they want to have that uh, motivation going forward. So that might be something that uh, works in our favour. But I think that Tottenham game really, uh, they're pushing for that title now. So that really is the the biggest game of the season, I think, left in the Premier League. Uh, Rick, uh, it, it's, it's going to be very tough. I, I'm you know, looking ahead. It, it's looking like uh, the Swansea game might be the one where Wenger's going to be tempted to, to rest some players, um, especially given we're at home. But but that's probably that's probably a dangerous match there because we're going to be tempted to rest players. You know, after Barcelona and Manchester United and Tottenham Hotspur coming up, you know, within four or five days. The temptation to rest people at Sw- or against Swansea is going to be pretty high, and, and that's a risk. But uh, you know, we got a lot of people back healthy again, um, so uh, I'm not feeling too bothered by it. I mean, we just talked about the fact that you know Campbell can't even get into the squad hardly anymore, so uh, we're in a good spot to actually rest people and bring in other players. So I don't feel too bad about it. Yeah, so I think it's just worth mentioning. Go on, Jeff. Go on, Jeff. Yeah, just- uh, basically, uh, I think um, Tottenham got uh, their round of 32 games coming up, so they got two games uh, up against uh, Fiorentina. So, uh, and as well, uh, looking at Man City, they've got that um, Dean with Kiev ties. That's a long trip, so I don't think we're the only ones worried about uh, this uh, little uh, fixture congestion. I think uh, it could play in our favour as well. Very, very good points. Um, uh, Axe? Yeah, I, you know, I think... You sort of look at that Barcelona game, yeah, I agree, it's a bit of a, a unwelcome sort of a distraction, but, you know, if you do get a positive result, can you imagine what that does for confidence? Similar to the Bayern Munich at home game, what it did for our confidence, we just, you know, all the Olympiacos game, it just did something, and then it, it could happen again, so I just, I, I, don't, I think the Barcelona game's important in a way that it, it, perhaps we can play without the pressure a little bit. You know, we can play how Leicester have been playing all season. Just just play our game, see what happens. But hopefully not get embarrassed. And, and, and you know, for once I'll take a glorious failure. Because I think there's glorious failures. Generally, we go on a run after them. So I'll, I'll, I'll certainly take a glorious failure here. So, you know, in terms of Spurs, there's still two league games before we play Spurs. So let's not worry about, about that for a while. Let's just win our next game which is the cup, let's win, win at Old Trafford, which will be huge. And then Swansea as well, then worry about Spurs. There's a long, it's, it's a long way away still, 5th of March. And I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't consider a Champions League match against Barcelona an um, unwelcome distraction any time. Uh, I'd, I'd like to win it. I'd like, I look forward to playing well. And we yeah, can on our day, we show know, we can beat anybody on our day. I yeah, I think, I think it's more yeah. because we, we are in a title sort of, you know, uh, a title race and stuff like that, where in the Champions League, obviously, if we were to overcome Barcelona, there's still big teams in there. So, you know, it, it, we're far more likely to win the league than we are the Champions League. I think that's why people kind of use those words. And I, I kind of see that. But, as I said, you know, if, if somehow we can overcome Barcelona, just imagine what it would do to this team. But, obviously, okay. that's a big if. <laughs> um, uh, OK, so, you know, we're back in the title race. Today was an absolute must. Really was a must win, really. Um, I suppose a draw we could have tolerated, but you know we could not have afforded to go eight points behind the league leaders. We're now back within two. Massive, massive result. Um, do you see... Is, is, the ball in our, is, is the ball now in our call? I mean, I know Leicester are ahead, but... Does it fill your does it re, fill your resolve with with even more faith that we can go on and win it, Rick? It, it's been in our hands for a couple months now. Uh, we obviously haven't taken tremendous advantage of it, but yeah, we we can't worry about what other teams do. We have to we have to just keep winning our matches. Um, obviously, we we still play Spurs, so that that can be quite a swing. Uh, a game against Manchester United, they're not as close uh, in the race as, as other teams, but. Um, and what is it? City penultimate game of the season is that when we play there? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so, you know, those are are big games based on the, the point swing that could happen between the two teams in it. But uh, other than those two matches, really, we just, we just got to keep winning. We can't worry about what Spurs do or what Leicester does. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Man United are probably thinking they've got two weeks to get Van Gaal out and Mourinho <laughs> in before the 28th of Feb, aren't they? You know, they just... Uh, <laughs> and what about you, Axel? I know you've always been pretty positive, and you know, even when we wavered a little, you, you know, you still hang around. Do you? Is it refilled your your faith? That, um, oh, it's, I, it, it, it's faith is a is a strong word, mate. You know, it's, it's football. It, it, it's more it, important it, than religion, mate. Come it, on, it's it's football. It's football. It, it, you know, I I I'm, I'm lucky enough to go up and down the country watching sort of our football club play and I think going there with a negative attitude maybe going there not believing I just I'd rather sit at home if I'm going to do that so it's not about faith or anything like that it's just about you want your club to 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 compete and at the moment we are two points behind I I think we should be we actually should be a few points clear I think looking at our fixtures and looking at you know if we look at Leicester's fixtures and who they've played we we probably should be clear, um, but there's no point kind of dwelling on that. It's just a matter of of just you know every game as it goes and just 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 kind of going for it. And, and you know the club are competing as I said, so let's hope and let's just uh, uh, hopefully believe in our team. But you know we'll see what happens. It's a long way Judge, to go. Judge yeah. destiny is it within us? Is it with us? Is it in our hands? Destiny, or is it a game by game thing like the others have said? I think uh, the story changes every week, so uh, it's tricky to say now, but it, it does feel like we've got 12 cup finals now, so uh, hopefully, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. I mean, I mean, Spurs could be saying the same thing, that Ericsson goal today, they they probably believe just as much. Leicester certainly believed last oh. week, so... Oh, they got a bit of a lucky penalty, though. Yeah, well, yeah. they did, but that's, the result is 2-1, and they've got three points. Exactly, so yeah. Uh, yeah, All right. we'll see. We'll see, we certainly will. I want to thank everyone for coming on this evening, Rick, Akil, and uh, the podcast novice Virgin uh, Jazz. Jazz, hope you can join us again in the future. Thanks for coming yeah, on, mate. Thanks thank you very much. No problem. Uh, I'll thank the listeners for, for tuning in. Uh, catch us on all the platforms, YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, the, the website, gunaramble.com. Also, don't forget the Guna Ramble quiz in association with the Arsenal Foundation at the Tonington on the 9th of March. If you haven't got your teams in, ask how do they do it and how long have they got to do it? Contact me on Twitter. Um, yeah, they've got as long as this space, which is about 50% in four days, so it's not bad. Coolio, all right. So get hold of her at 10 Akil on Twitter. I've been Giles. This has been great. Hope you've had a great Valentine's. Catch you again soon. Up the Arsenal. Up the the Arsenal. Loire one double Leicester City. El centro de la de Manuel.